Welcome to the Metaphysical Martini Show, where wit and wisdom come together to bridge the gap between the spirit realm and the physical world. With Ani Avedisian, the Suburban Shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio. Hello everyone, I'm Ani Avedisian. Welcome to Metaphysical Martini. Three parts spirit, one part rational mind. Add two drops of optimism, give it all a good hard shake and pour, dress it with the olives of grace and empathy, sit back, sip slowly, and contemplate the wonders of cosmic co creation. And a hearty hello to everyone out there. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for joining us for yet another round of cocktails on this week's Metaphysical Martini, the show that tries to sort out what's true, what's woo, and what gets flushed down the loo in today's antagonized, far from civilized, compromised, demon-supervised apology for an ascending world. People still walk their dogs wearing masks. I see this every day, because I walk every day without a mask. I see people jogging wearing masks, driving around in open top convertibles wearing masks. Some people are putting masks on their dogs. How many levels of imbecility do we have to witness before Mother Earth decides we are all far too stupid to take up space on her precious, lovely body? Now, peeps, don't misunderstand me. I know there is plenty of resistance to the attempted New World Order, globalist, luciferian, totalitarian takeover of our species. There are just as many free thinkers as there are brainwashed automatons. You won't know about that because, you know, mainstream media, what I call the mouth of Sauron, won't report it. They don't report anything, really, not anymore. They simply relay propaganda handed over by their corporate overlords some of which is in the realms of the ridiculous, but still, people buy it. People believe it. Because they've forgotten how to think for themselves. Feeble-minded, we have become unable to make intelligent decisions or judgments, lacking in sense and clear direction. No longer are we the sharpest kids on the block, no. Now we sit in the back of the class and bleat with the weaker members of the flock. Such insanity on our gorgeous planet. Lost in the branch of the matrix that operates a program designed with one purpose only. The psychological manipulation of our consciousness. Masters and slaves, the oligarchs who feast, and the ones who accepted the mark of the beast. Oh my God, here she goes again with her mark of the beast thing. Well, my darlings, hello. If you're looking for political correctness, Metaphysical Martini is not the show for you. We don't do politically correct because PC is designed to erode our intellect. But we do come from a core of respect. Common sense, common courtesy, common decency. We are common folk. And these are the wonderful values the establishment are falling over themselves to replace with the mind-numbing programming of political correctness. Well, not on this show. We just don't go in for that sort of thing here. Here, we honor soul sovereignty and the importance, the importance of personal autonomy and the self-determination of human beings over their own bodies. Surely only someone with severely diminished mental capacity would would disagree with that. And because, I have to say, let's remember we're on a physical realm, our God-given right to freedom over tyranny, it's something that we have to actively affirm and work for. Every single day, it's a God-given right, but on physical realms, we have to fight for these things. And that's why we martini heads, we are pro-Second Amendment. We are critical thinkers. We train our minds to think. And then we do a bit of recreational shooting and hone our skills as we plink. 
And if you have to ask why the Second Amendment is important, I respectfully put forward the notion that you have no idea how the world works and who calls the shots. No pun intended, by the way. Well, where are we today? Today, what is it? It's Wednesday, April 27th, 2021, I believe. I could have got the date wrong. I don't know. But it is a Wednesday and we're close to the end of April. And this show, graciously produced by Cosmic Reality Radio in Florida, is recorded in Oregon, USA, where we are currently suffering horribly from two things. Number one. Governor Kate Brown's attempts to turn us into an outpost of the reptilian empire. What a dreadful woman she is, and clearly in the pocket of the Luciferians. And number two, the blooming of that vicious invasive plant, almost as bad as the reptilian empire, known as Scottish broom. And we hates it, we does, my precious. We hates it with a vengeance. It covers everything we own in potent pollen. It clogs our noses and our airways, and it gives us headaches, and it makes us very hard for us to breathe. And oh, how we suffer in Oregon from the yellow demon each year, as spring prepares to morph into summer. This dreadful weed was introduced from Europe as a garden ornamental by early settlers of the Pacific Northwest. Had they but known how much suffering their actions would cause future generations, I'm sure they would have made a different decision. Well, we are, however, a hardy lot, so we will push on with the show, even though we can't breathe. Let's begin with the main reason for this show, quack. Questions, answers and comments. We started Martini to find out what we the people are thinking. Now, there's no censorship on this show, so feel free to express yourselves. Of course, that doesn't mean I'm going to read pornography or incite violence or encourage mockery and insults and other immature, non-productive behavior. It means I will not censor, edit or otherwise discredit your ideology. So if you would like to share the contents of your illuminated minds on this beacon of radiance of a show, send your questions and comments to me. That is Cosmic Ani. P.O. Box 714, Wilsonville, Oregon, 97070, USA. And peeps, don't forget to tell me if and how you wish to be identified, or I will refer to you as omit personal details. All righty, let's, well, you know what, let's just have a drinky poo of my chosen little cocktail. Give it a little stir, because it's a big one today. Well, it's always a big one, but it's just in a bigger glass this time with more ice. Mm. Ooh, that's not bad at all. Mm. All right, now that I'm fortified, let's shake up the fishbowl of perpetual perplexity. Shaky, shaky, shaky. Let's see what falls out. All right. Our first question today comes from Andrew in Ashland, which is way down on the southern borders of Oregon. And Andrew asks, Dear Ani, what is your definition of healing and why would I visit a spiritual healer? Well, that's a jolly good question. Andrew, my definition of healing is simple. When one is in alignment with and attuned to supreme cosmic intelligence, one has no need of healing because all disease, all dysfunction stems from a sense of separation from source energy. If the knowledge of your true divine nature is the dominant stable vibration in your being, disease dysfunction is dealt with as it comes up. Now, why would you see a spiritual healer? Well, I guess when you need help understanding the aforementioned concept. In addition to explaining it to you and helping you understand it according to your level of awareness, the spiritual healer will also calibrate your energy anatomy to its correct frequency, so you will better understand the concepts discussed. And that's all it is, you see. It's not miracle work. We are not special people. We do not work miracles. Miracles happen when you take care of the mundane, daily, 
diligently and with devotion. The little things done every day. As I say, persistence, diligence and focus and a little sprinkling of incense and hocus pocus. Take care of the mundane and the magic will flow through you. So thank you for that, Andrew. And I'm sure in Ashland, there's a woo community and you'll find yourself a lovely spiritual healer. And when you do, let me know. All right, let's take some other questions. Where, where is my, oh, there it is. Okay, jolly good. All right, here's another metaphysical missive. And this is from Elias who asks, Dear Ani, I recently started a course in miracles. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> And I am already baffled just by the first lesson. I am supposed to look at a table and declare that it does not mean anything, after which I'm supposed to look at a chair and declare that it does not mean anything. Then I'm supposed to do the same with my hand, my foot, my pen, and apparently anything in my sights and declare they are meaningless. Ani, this course goes on for one year and I am stuck on lesson one. Is it worth it? I mean, a chair has a purpose, doesn't it? I'm sitting on one now as I write to you. <laughs> Elias, if I had a dollar for every time I received a letter like this one, well, I would have quite a few dollars. Now, old chap, Given the borderline resistance you are experiencing, I would say, yes, it's worth it and definitely go ahead with it. Now, let me see if I can explain this. The lesson is not designed to teach you that these things have no purpose. A chair was built as a resting place for your bottom. The lesson is designed to encourage you not to assign any particular meaning to it. You see, Elias, you know it's a chair. Because on this planet, humans have bottoms, millions of bottoms, billions of bottoms. And for thousands of years, carpenters have made chairs for those bottoms. Now, just a thought, what would a visitor from another planet, a planet on which the beings had no bottoms, make of your chair? Our bottomless star brother or sister would have no frame of reference for it. And as such, he or she might declare it meaningless. He would have a totally fresh perspective on it. And that's the key, a totally fresh perspective on it. The course is designed to alter your perception from mortal to divine. And on physical worlds, where we have a tendency to dismiss anything we cannot touch and physically interact with, that can be a long process. The very nature of true perception is that it has no limits. It's the opposite of the way we are trained to see. So the course first helps you to undo the way you are trained to see, and then, in the second part, trains you to acquire true divine perception. In my opinion, the more resistance you have to it, or should I say, rather, the more you are baffled by it, the more you will gain from it. It's a challenge for sure, but it's not as though you're being challenged to a duel and someone dies. You are challenging yourself to expand in consciousness. And that, dear Andrew, is quite fabulous. Now, for all you other people out there who are having trouble with A Course in Miracles, um, don't forget to read through the introduction first and see if you can't join a local group if there is one because everybody suffers in the beginning and it is a very long-winded course, but there's a tremendous amount of value in it to retrain you, to untrain you and then retrain you. So don't give up. If you feel you need it, find a local group and uh, you know push through. If, if you absolutely just can't handle it, it, maybe it's just not the right time, but don't dismiss it because it's long-winded and it tells you that a chair is not a chair, because clearly a chair is a chair. But it's only a chair because you're using it as a chair because you have a bottom. If you didn't have a bottom, what would it be? So there we are. Fantastic, honey. Stop rambling on and get on to the next question. Let's take another question from the fishbowl of perpetual perplexity. 
And this one is from uh, Omit Personal Details, who says, Hello, Arnie. Why can't mankind get it right? Why do we run from one extreme to the other and back over and over again through history, making the same mistakes? What is our fundamental problem? Don't our souls become weary of this constant game of groans? Ooh, game of groans. I love that. May I use that? That's a nice one. I'd give you credit, but you haven't given me <clears throat> permission to use your name. Okay, game of groans. Why can't mankind find middle ground and break the seemingly eternal cycle of dysfunction? This is what you're asking. What is our fundamental problem? Well, omit. I would say that's a simple one. Mankind's fundamental problem is the decision to keep separate from its true nature. End of story. It is the root of every problem on this realm today. You either choose to explore and accept your true nature, which is, of course, a cosmic divine manifestation and live a functional, productive and relatively happy life. Or you can pretend that you're just a lump of meat and live a half life, allowing yourself to be manipulated by the agenda of others. That's it. That's all she wrote. That's all there is. That is the fundamental problem, the root cause. But she also asked, why won't people focus on the simplicity of the root issue? You know, why don't we get the fundamental? Well, I, you know, let's ask CNN or the BBC or other outlets of the Luciferian totalitarian propaganda. That's the disconnect right there. Every time you get close to the root of the problem, you're disconnected from it. And as to don't our souls get weary of the game of groans, souls are resilient, quite resilient. And in between incarnations, they don't have to operate through a human interface. So no, without the human filter, they don't have the sense of suffering and the angst and other petty manifestations of the false alter ego that we experience when we're working through the filter of humanity. That's why we get so many more brownie points for expanding consciousness and awaking while in physical form, because it's not easy. In fact, it's bloody difficult, but it is far from impossible. You see, people, we set these challenges up for ourselves on the other side before we came down. We didn't come down to burn and crash. We came down to make a splash. So people, let's get out there. Let's have some fun with all of this insanity and let's do something useful with our incarnations. Thank you for the question, omit personal details. Always get to the root of the problem and sort that out and don't be distracted by the details because that's where the devil lives. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, shall we take another question? Let's take a look. We've had a few more than usual this week. You never know how it's going to go, you know, with the questions. I mean, some weeks we have three or four. That's it. And then some weeks we have close to 50, which, you know, it's quite amazing, really. All right. Let's uh, <clears throat> unwrap this one. And this is from Sylvanus Windrunner. <laughs> very funny. Very funny indeed. Um, anyone out there who is familiar with the realm of Azeroth, is familiar with Sylvanas Windrunner. She is the Dark Lady, the Banshee Queen, former war chief of the Horde and supreme leader of the Forsaken. And before Arthas of Menethil ripped out her soul and turned her into a Banshee, she was the highly revered Ranger General of Silvermoon, an elven warrior without equal, who defended Kel Talas from the Scourge invasion. Unfortunately for all the good guys, she fell in battle. And that's when Arthas, instead of honoring her by giving her a quick death, turned her into a wailing banshee, turning her away from the light and enslaving her as a hate-filled agent of the Lich King. And for those unfamiliar with the story of Azeroth, which I suspect might be quite a few of you, the Lich King is bad juju. And Sylvanas, fall from grace through no fault of her own, is the most tragic episode in the elven history of Azeroth 
to date. Well, that was so much more than you needed to know about what was going on in the realm of Azeroth, but there you are. Sylvanas Windrunner asks, Dear Ani, I read your blog and I follow you on social media and you have spoken on more than one occasion about a possible zombie apocalypse. Are you being serious? And what is your definition of a zombie? Are you talking like Shaun of the Dead type zombies, where the walking dead eat your flesh, or something more subtle? Also, how could something like this happen without people sensing the danger in advance? Oh, what a question, Sylvanas. <clears throat> well, darling, I guess I have to admit, on quite a few levels, yes, I am serious. I'm serious because we live in a world of infinite possibilities. And by the way, thanks for mentioning Shaun of the Dead, one of my favorite movies starring Simon Pegg. He basically plays an employee in a London electronic shop who has, shall we say, a lackluster life. He plays video games. He drinks beer down the pub with his mates. And one day he decides that something has to change. He has to get some direction in life because, you know, he's in danger of losing his girlfriend now because he's such a twit. But before he can get his life back on track, a mysterious plague hits the UK, creating hordes of zombies, the Walking Dead variety. Oh, and by the way, this is a comedy and a particularly good one at that. Uh, all right, back to your question, Sylvanas. The zombie apocalypse. There are many stages to an actual zombie apocalypse. Stage one is subtle. It is when people believe everything they hear on mainstream media without bothering to do any research. Stage one is when these people blindly follow instructions they receive through that mainstream media. For example, they believe there is an actual pandemic when clearly any free thinking rodent can see that there is no such thing. Stage one is the stabilization of the illusion, convincing the masses that something that clearly does not exist and clearly is not happening does indeed exist and is indeed happening. Stage two is when those who have immersed themselves in the illusion and are now living in the fear willingly line up to be injected with an experimental toxin designed to disrupt the human interface, irrevocably polluting the human gene pool and setting the stage for mass depopulation, which is also called mass murder. And who knows what else is in that toxin? It's not just viruses and parasites and neurotoxins that turn people into zombies. There is the issue of nanoparticles, and all manner of AI controlled zombie scenarios that I, for one, not sure I want to stick around for. So, yes, Sylvanas, tongue in cheek though I am, knowing that life is an illusion and all things exist at once, I suppose I am being serious because we are currently at stage two, aren't we? I mean, we are. You can't deny it. Now, you also asked me how can this happen without people sensing the danger. Well, I'll tell you how. It's easy to explain. For years, people have been trained to accept serious side effects, up to and including mortal death, as acceptable outcomes when taking modern medication. I'm going to repeat that. For years, people have been trained to accept serious side effects up to and including mortal death as acceptable outcomes when using modern medications. If you think about that for a minute, television commercials for modern medications always end with a rapid declaration of potential serious side effects. Pharma ads in papers have up to two pages sometimes of potential adverse side effects listed. You would think that alone would be a red flag for people, but apparently not. You know, you hear these conversations in, in people's heads. Oh my God, Julian, the doctor wants me to take these meds for my little rash, but the side effects include kidney failure, brain death, 
spontaneous combustion of the bladder, migraine, urinary retract infection, hirsutism, a tendency to declare myself gender neutral, erectile dysfunction, even though I don't have a penis, heart valve malfunction, and something called San Pellegrino. Julian, do you think it's worth the risk? Well, no, Doris, I don't. Don't be so bloody stupid. Just put some cream on your rash and adopt a better diet. I will remind you all that most zombie movies begin with a guy in a white lab coat telling everyone everything will be okay if you just do as you are told. And in these movies, it always turns out that the root cause of the zombie apocalypse was manufactured in a lab. Ooh, does that sound familiar? Sylvanas, thank you for the question. And I don't know who you are because you are Sylvanas, but if you are a member of my guild, the Raiders of the Tanan Jungle, do send me an in-game email and say hi. You know, mm, I'm not gonna go into details of why I'm so familiar with the world of Warcraft, but I think I've mentioned in previous podcasts that some of my younger clients who have um, issues they're not comfortable expressing in person see me in character within this game. And we have some wonderful results. And a pleasant side effect for me is meeting lovely people and killing monsters, which always makes you feel better. Thank you, Sylvanas Windrunner, former Ranger General of the Elven Nation, um, for that very important question. Fear not, though. I don't actually think we're going to get to full-blown zombie. I think we might get to level three, but I don't think we'll get beyond. All right, well, I think it's time for a little sip of my drinky poo. Excuse me, folks. Uh, feel free to make yourselves um, a drink, by the way. Mm. Ooh, spicy. Mm. All right, let's take another question. And this one is from Cody. Cody, who says, Ani, everyone tells me that ghosts have to be moved on. But why is that? Why can't they stay here if they're having a good time? I have a ghost and we have a lovely relationship. Cody. OK, let me answer that question before before evaluating your mental health issues. Cody, in short, because physical realms are for physical bodies. That's really the main thing, isn't it? Spirit bodies, uh, which are not the same as ghosts, can pass through but there would be no value in them staying long term as a physical realm is not their primary realm of experience. If your body dies and you go to heaven, you've made it over there, you are a spirit. If you die and you stay on earth, that's what we call a ghost. So now I want you to put yourself in the ghost's shoes. One minute, you have a nice little meat body and you can run and jump and swim and eat chocolate and drink beer and feel the fresh air on your face and all that good tactile stuff. In fact, all your physical senses work to your advantage on a physical realm. And then the next minute, boom, your body is dead and you can't interact with the physical world because you have lost your physical body. It would be similar to a really bad acid trip. I mean, you're there but you can't connect or interact in any meaningful way. And the whole thing is just a little bit spooky. I know people are afraid of ghosts, but believe me, people, when I say it's the ghosts who are afraid. So, Cody, I doubt that any ghosts stuck in this plane are having a good time. Another factor is this, of course, and this is important. The soul has to get back to heaven to debrief. And once it's done that, it is released from the limitations of the one personality it played in that last incarnation. After we have that debriefing or life review, all that stuff that we go through on the other side, you know, we crave the integration with our cumulative soul. We want to debrief that one personality so that then we can remember everything that we've ever been, every one that we've ever been. I would hate to think that for the rest of eternity, I would be stuck in just one personality. I would want to join with all of my experiences and be the whole me, not just Arnie. And that isn't going to happen if you don't make it back to heaven. So that's a good question. 
and thank you for asking it. It comes up quite a lot, but it's a very important question because people still don't quite understand how the interdimensional realms work. So if you have a ghost, people, be nice to it, and hopefully it will be nice to you. Remember that a ghost is stuck in its personality, so I'd like you to relate to it as you would a solid human being and converse with it. And if you feel that you're uncomfortable with any of that, just pray and ask the divine to open a portal. There's a specific type of angelic being that just goes around opening portals and taking these darlings over to the other side where they can be received in God's unconditional love and debriefed and then join their cumulative souls. Very important. Thank you, Cody, for that question. Do we have time for one more drink? I mean, I meant question, Freudian slip. Oh, I'll have another drink. Excuse me. I'll have another sip here. Mm. Mm. You know, not all my cocktails work out really well. That's the nature of experimentation. But this one, it's good. Trust me, people, it's good. All right, we have time for one more question. Let's give the fish bowl a good shake up. This one is from Angela, who asks, Dear Ani, what do you say to people who don't believe in God? Well, Angela, um, I don't say anything. I mean, why would I? It's none of my business what they choose to believe. And the word God is such a highly charged word, isn't it? Some think of God as a bearded man sitting on a cloud in a place called heaven. Some think of God as universal energy guiding mankind in ways they have possibly no explanation for. Others dismiss the notion of deities as mere superstition. And then there's everything in between. Clearly, there is structure to the cosmos. And I think it would be naive for anyone to assume that some sort of supreme cosmic creator moderator being doesn't exist and i certainly have my own understanding of universal law but each of us will get to that place of alignment in our way and in our own time because you see it's all about connection isn't it we all crave connection connection with source even if we don't entertain the possibility of its existence People personify deities because they can't wrap their minds around the infinite. And those who seek the infinite don't like the personification of the deity. Because once you do personify a deity, you've given it human characteristics, and that's ass backwards. The divine doesn't have any human characteristics. All beings are a manifestation of its adventure. And there's no such thing as the correct answer for any of that introspection the courage to do that the exploration of our consciousness of the whole cosmos daring to pierce the barriers of our inner consciousness man that's the ultimate adventure isn't it it's just wonderful thanks for that question really enjoyed that that was angela and maybe time for one more quick question um which i have here from somebody called omit personal details who says, Arnie, sometimes I think you're very heavy handed and we would appreciate a softly, softly approach. Well, I'd love to give you a softly, softly approach because, you know, my character is a little direct and all of that, but I'm actually a very lovely person. I'm into all the gentleness. That's me. The problem with the softly, softly approach is, you see, <laughs> look around you. People are being lied to right to their faces and they still don't realize it. How do you think my softly, softly rainbows and unicorns is going to reach them? It's just not the time for a softly, softly approach. It's time to put the truth forward and try to maintain grace and not get flipped out when people don't take your advice. Because believe me, I've been doing this job for 40 years. People pay good money not to take my advice. I think that there's a difference between being angry and pointing out the truth and just pointing out the truth in a direct way. Anyway, if you're ever in my part of town, take me out for a cup of coffee or I'll take you out and you'll see just how lovely and soft I am. All right, people. 
thank you so much for questions, answers, and comments. People, keep them coming, keep them coming, because this is what it's all about, finding a nice, safe place for us to talk to each other and discuss these things that perhaps we're not particularly comfortable discussing with our family, our friends, our business colleagues, our pastors, our imams, whatever, you know? So thank you much and keep them coming. All right, now I have misplaced my kazoo. So for my very expensive side effect, we're going to use my gong. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, martini heads. Now it's time for tarot a go go a little what the heck with your favorite tarot deck and we are currently using the robin wood deck because it's pretty and it's also smaller and fits into my little tiny hands and this week's card is the four of cups so let's take a look at this card and see what impressions it transmits anybody out there following along the four of cups All right so I've got this chap in my upright position. And what do we see? This tarot isn't about looking in the book and getting, you know, your responses from there. It's about having a relationship with the cards and the people in the cards and letting them tell you what the information du jour is. So on the Four of Cups, there's a young man sitting under a tree. And in my deck, he looks a little disillusioned, perhaps a little pissed, not as in drunk, just a little pissed off, peeved, I should say. In front of him, there are three cups in the upright position. Can't tell if there's anything in them. And to his left on the cards is another cup, a chalice, a golden chalice that's being presented to him. And it's radiating like, you know, beams are coming off it. He seems to be looking straight ahead, though, over the three cups that are in front of him. And I'm not sure if he has seen the glowing chalice and has dismissed it or if he's just missing the obvious. Because, you know, a glowing chalice, it's kind of obvious. The card looks like a spring day, is a blue enough sky. The tree looks like it's got some buds on it. The grass is green. Um... What's the immediate impression as I look at this Four of Cups? Discontent. I definitely get discontent. He's definitely not satisfied, not in the best space, but he has withdrawn to think about things a little bit. I get that impression. He's a little bored, maybe a little soul weary, um, not in the mood for any social interaction. I don't think he's apathetic, although that could be an aspect of this card. He's, is he turning inward? Is he evaluating stuff? Is he lost in the silence? Or is he just momentarily distracted and just wants to keep himself to himself because something didn't quite work out the way that he thought it might work out? Is he feeling empty inside? Is he upset? It doesn't look to me like long-term depression. I really get the impression by looking at this card that something happened that didn't work out that really pissed him off. It's more than ennui. There's a touch of resentment here. So he's taken himself away from his home, his friends. He's out in nature, which is always a good idea when you're depressed. And he's looking within. He's got that sort of nobody understood me thing, feeling to him. But um, he's going to sort it out. Still can't figure out whether he's not seeing that golden chalice as he looks ahead um, or if he's just dismissing him. But sometimes when we're not feeling well, we just don't get the obvious or we're not ready to see the new opportunity until we have thoroughly grieved our angst. So when you get this card and it's at the upright position, yeah, things feel a little unsatisfying, an anticlimax perhaps, things didn't work out the way that you wanted. Um, I also feel that perhaps he's rejecting help that was offered because that chalice could be could mean that. It could be an opportunity. 
but it could be the opportunity of help that he was offered. Something is missing from this chap's life. And I do hope that he doesn't cut himself off for too long. I think I hope that he does a little bit of meditation and contemplation. Um, you know, to be a recluse once in a while is pretty good. But I hope he sorts out the state of his dissatisfaction. Now, I'm going to turn the card into the reversed position, because this is always a source of discontent for tarotologists, especially, you know, newbies to the, you know, newbies to the trade. Like, oh, what does it mean if it's upside down? Does it mean the opposite? It means a lot of things. And sometimes if it's upside down, you still read it right way up. That's why I'm so adamant when I tell people learning the tarot is all about becoming familiar with the cards until they talk to you. You'll learn all the theory, you'll learn the archetypes, you'll learn all the book learning, I, you will, but the cards have to come to life in your hand. And that only happens when you hold them and stare at them and contemplate with them and form a relationship with them. So I'm turning this chap upside down. And the first thing that people would say, well, all the stuff that was in the cups has fallen out. But you know what? I actually feel that this is the end of all his problems. I feel very much that his motivation is going to return. I feel like he wants to go back and socialize again. I think he's revitalized. Yeah, I think he's done. I think his cups runneth over with woe. So he turned them upside down and emptied them. And he's starting again. And that's a very positive outcome. However, depending on the reading, there is always the possibility that he could have gone completely the other way and wallowed in self-pity and had a real sense of, oh, despair, despair, no enjoyment in life. Everybody hates me. Nobody understands me. I can't catch a break. You know how we get there. That's why it's so important when you begin to feel depressed to breathe out the emotional triggers so you don't go to a bad place. So, yeah, it could be the end of his problems or it could be that he's gone the other way. And uh, the person who picks the card can apply the correct outcome to it. Very interesting. But I feel it's a very positive one today. And I do feel so very positive today. It could be the cocktail. But then again, I haven't finished it. So I'm not really feeling the effects of it either. But there we are. Tarot a go go. Folks, if you want um, some training with tarot, go to my website and take a look at my tarot page. I have courses for people who want to take tarot seriously, and I have little courses for people who just want a little understanding to get them on the right track. No point in spending hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars and investing that in training that you don't need or want. All right, what shall we do next? Mm, let's ring our gong and see if we have any inspiration. Ah, yes, I feel the inspiration coming my way. I think what we should do is have a little weird and wacky history. Once in a while, I do like to take a look at some strange and juicy little tidbits that I can dig up from the past, because it's fun and, you know, trivia. I'm not very good at small talk, believe it or not, even though I talk for a living. Um, I had to learn to be socially interactive. I was quite quiet as a child. So I found early on in life that if you learnt a lot of trivia and made people laugh, social interaction was easier. Now, over the years, I'm better at social interaction, certainly, but I still collect these little tidbits. So let's take a look at weird and wacky tidbits of history. Here's one I came across last night. Um, in medieval Europe, field surgeons would urinate on soldiers' wounds. Now, that sets up a visual, doesn't it? <laughs> now, this wasn't a mark of disrespect. It was to sterilize the wound because, of course, urine has ammonia. So I suppose the surgeons kept very well hydrated so they could have lots of disinfectant on hand. Or should I say, <laughs> 
in hand. <laughs> um, there's even an account I found of an Italian surgeon, one chap called Leonardo Fioravanti, who saved a soldier's life by urinating on the soldier's face, ick, and also urinating on the soldier's severed nose and somehow reattaching it to his face. And lo and behold, it worked even back in medieval time. And the soldier even regained his sense of smell. And I hope that it was a full range of smell and not just urine that he smelled. But I think that's kind of fascinating. OK, I know Romans used to do their laundry with urine because of all the ammonia. All those white togas had to be bleached in the ammonia. Interesting. Um, and during the second, no, the First World War, when there was mustard gas in the trenches, and they didn't quite know how to deal with it. One doctor came up with the idea that if you soaked your masks in your own urine, that would save you from the effects of mustard gas. Of course, I don't know how it felt to walk around all day smelling your own urine either. Um, anyway, I have to research that further because that's kind of interesting. Next little tidbit I found when I was making my cocktail today is about Worcestershire sauce, or as Americans call it, Worcestershire sauce. Um, now, I consider this sauce to be an essential ingredient in a proper Bloody Mary. But do we know its origin? Well, as we know, England colonized India and, and a lot of other places and gained access to its resources, not the least of which in India were the exotic spices. So there's this English nobleman chappy who falls in love with a sauce that he encounters in Bengal. And he has the creator of the sauce write down the recipe. So he brings the recipe back to England and he goes to visit two chemists, John Lee and William Perrins. And he says, can you recreate the sauce? And they said, OK, mate, we'll give it a shot, you know. And they do just that. They recreate it according to the instructions. But guess what? Once they've made it, it's utterly disgusting. So much so that they left the barrels in the cellar and forgot about them for two years, I think. But lucky for us, when they finally decided to dispose of the barrels to make room for something else, they opened one up just for giggles and had a little taste. And guess what? After two years maturation, it was delicious. So that's how we got Lee and Perrin Worcestershire sauce. And it went on the market 1838. And it has been a bestseller ever since. And in my opinion, you can't make a Bloody Mary without it. And of course, it's yummy in marinades. So that is the history of how we got Worcester sauce. We call it Worcester, we don't know what's called it, Worcestershire. Actually, to be honest, we call it Liam Perrins. So there we are. Oh, let's see, a few more little tidbits. Ah, I was researching wine the other day, because I like wine, and I discovered that the oldest known bottle of wine is called the Speyer wine bottle. And they found this bottle in Germany in 1876. And it is believed to date back as far as 350 common era. That is amazing. No one tried drinking it, though, because I do know that archaeologists from time to time, they'll taste something that's really ancient if it's been sealed. But I suspect um, glass was not made um, without lead and without strange things in it. No one has drunk it. They will probably die if they do. But fascinating. What else did I find? for your amusement and your edification, my darlings. I found out that um, until 1961, suicide, the act of, was illegal in England and Wales, and you could be fined or imprisoned for it. Can you imagine? I'm pretty sure that England and Wales were the last to decriminalize it, because uh, Europeans, I think, were way ahead of them in that. So you're so depressed you want to kill yourself. And instead of giving you the help that you need, they give you a fine. And I'm sure most people wanted to kill themselves because they didn't have enough money. So they fine you 
to make it all better. And then they imprison you. So you go to prison. You're so depressed, you want to kill yourself. So they'll put you in prison so you can be even more depressed. What craziness, absolutely craziness. Oh, and I was having a little conversation with um, a young teen the other day, and they wanted to talk about poo, as in human feces, and the importance of it. Because this young chap, he had a bit of a kidney problem, and we were discussing proper diet and all the things that the intestines do, you know, keep you clean. It's like your sewage system. You've got to keep the poo moving. So we researched poo-poo together. And we found that in February 1995, working in conjunction with nutritionists at the University of Michigan's Ann Arbor, this chap adopted a super fiber rich diet, which enabled him to produce, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but it's true, a single extruded excrement, the exact length of his colon, 26 feet. So a single extruded, so a full poo with no breaks. And this was documented, apparently, at uh, the bowling alley of the Cranwood Kingswood High School out there in Michigan, um, because it had to be a floor length suitable for the process of measuring a very long poo. Um, this chap admits that he took a lot of Metamucil and he didn't poo for a week. So I hope he had medical attention, because if you don't poo for a week, you could spontaneously combust. But that is true, folks. The longest single extruded poo is 26 feet long. I don't think they kept it, but they probably took a picture of it, and I don't want to see any pictures of it. If you find pictures of the big poo, don't send me. I'm not interested. But that was an interesting little tidbit. What else did we uh, research with this young man? Um, oh, yes, we were talking about modern medications and how um, fiber is better than medicine some of the time. And we found out from one of the BBC sites that scientists have recreated a ninth century Anglo-Saxon remedy using onion, garlic and part of a cow's stomach. And it successfully knocked out MRSA. Mercer's pretty nasty. And I'm going to have to say this isn't the first time that I've heard of university departments, especially back in the UK, some of the food chemistry departments. They find medieval or pre-medieval recipes and they recreate them and they test them on modern bugs. And they're generally 99% to 100% effective. So this is a thousand year old plus uh, treatment that completely wiped out MRSA. Fantastic. And they're going to share their findings at the next National Microbiology Conference. So cow stomach, onions and garlic. Probably had a bit of wine in there. They always used wine in there to, as, as the liquid. All right. Another little tidbit for our amusement. Um, for anybody out there who has tattoos, I have a, a tattoo. In fact, one of the things I thought about doing when I was younger was having Huey, Dewey and Louie tattooed on my bottom. And I'm glad I didn't, because when I was younger, I had a very nice, tight little bottom. Now I have a rather expansive middle aged bottom. So they wouldn't be Huey, Dewey and Louie anymore, would they? They'd be like three monster ducks. I'm glad I didn't do it. But did you know, oh, you people with tattoos, that you can leave your tattoos behind after you die? Yes, folks, the National Association for the Preservation of Skin Art will preserve it in a frame and present it to your loved ones. Well, I can't deny that there's some beautiful skin art out there. I don't have lots of tattoos. I just have a tiny little Armenian flag on my left arm um, that's rapidly fading. Hmm. What else? Oh, yes, I was going through my prepping kit the other day. And I was, you know, putting my cans of Spam in order. Spam isn't something I would eat normally, but in my God forbid scenario, it's pretty good for flavoring a skillet. So I was looking through my Spam, counting my Spam for the God forbid scenario. And I realized, or I read, I looked it up, Hawaii consumes the most Spam, but it was invented in Minnesota. 
spam comes from Minnesota. And there's even a spam museum in Minnesota. I mean, I did not know that. That is amazing. Something else I discovered, because once I get on this thing, I just keep going. Um, Fruit Loops, which I'm not sure are a food group, but Fruit Loops, even though they're multicolored, they're all one flavor. I also discovered that Thomas Jefferson is responsible for bringing the first macaroni machine over to the United States after he spent all that time in France. And they say he was also the one who introduced mac and cheese to Americans. How fabulous are the founding fathers? Sam Adams introduced good ale. I mean, these people did good things. What else did I look? Oh, yes. I was looking up cheese because it's off my diet. I'm not allowed to eat it. And I was having cravings. So there is a place in Serbia that makes cheese. I think it's called Pule. And it costs over a thousand dollars per pound. And that's because it's made of donkey milk. And I think we all know that donkeys are very stubborn and probably don't want to be milked. Now, what else did I discover? Yes. I was looking at gin recipes because gin is very fashionable again right now. My local liquor store, Stafford Beverage in Wilsonville, they have multiple shelves of all these designer gins. I don't mind gin, but I don't like tonic. Gin and tonic is a no-no for me. But I did learn that tonic water glows in the dark. Isn't that fantastic? It's the quinine, the component in the tonic water. That's what causes it to glow. So perhaps I'll just pour myself a G&T just to look at it. I don't have to drink it. And the other little tidbit that I learned, each year, Americans consume enough peanut butter to coat the floor of the Grand Canyon. That's 500 million pounds to be exact. Darlings, that is a lot of peanut butter. I tried peanut butter on a few occasions because I live in America. I am an American now, and my partner is an American, and my partner does love a PBJ. Um, didn't care for it much. It doesn't really digest, does it? It just sort of goes in you and sticks around, and then you have to have as much Metamucil as this guy in Michigan who did the 26-foot poo to move the peanut butter out of you. So I've never really understood the allure of peanut butter, but there we go. All right. Well, I hope that was amusing. I love these little tidbits. And uh, on our next show, we will go back to having Plato Chips, where we will quote and talk about a philosopher of note. But for today, my sweet angelic darlings out there, I think we're coming to the end of the show. I'm about to have the last sip of this excellent, excellent cocktail. Excuse me while I <clears throat> while I drink. Mm, mm. Mm. Oh, Joseph and Mary, that is good. Mm. I finished my drink. <laughs> and that always means the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed listening in as much as I enjoyed recording it, because I do. I look forward to this so much. Now, today's cocktail is a classic Bloody Mary. There are many variations on this recipe. And there are also many good mixers out there. Yes, I said mixers. Don't, uh, don't go mad, you purists. And by all means, do your own thing. But this is how yours truly, Arnie Avedisian, mistress of meditation and madam of mixology, makes the perfect Bloody Mary. You take two ounces of good quality vodka, not the bottom shelf stuff to clean your toilet with. I'm currently using Crater Lake vodka. Then you take five ounces of good quality tomato juice, two dashes of a Worcestershire sauce, one good dash of hot sauce. And I recommend sticking with Tabasco for cocktails because it has no equal. For food, it's Frank's Red Hot. But for cocktails, it's traditional Tabasco. You want a quarter lemon wedge, some freshly cracked black pepper and a celery stick. Combine all of that into a tall glass with a couple of cubes of ice in the bottom. 
and really stir it well, stir it, stir it, stir it with that celery stick, and then just drink it. Now, the lemon wedge is essential. You have to have a little bit of lemon in there, otherwise it won't balance out the hot sauce. It's delicious. And remember, folks, cocktails are great if they are an occasional treat. If you use top quality ingredients and take the art of mixology seriously, one drink is usually all you need. But hey, don't forget to add liquor to your prepping supplies, because should things go south, a shot of spirit helps to lift the spirit. I'm Arnie Avedisian. This was Metaphysical Martini, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio, to whom we are most grateful. Until we meet again, let the spirit inhabit the human. You have been listening to The Metaphysical Martini Show with Ani Avedisian, the suburban shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio.